Hi, my name is Professor Don Patterson, and in this lecture I'd like to talk a little bit about the concept of ubiquitous computing and how it leads into the idea of cloud computing. Key points from this lecture are to recognize that ubiquitous computing is a paradigm for people's relationship to computers, about the scale, the invisibility, and then what results from the changes when we get a mobile-first kind of world. So let's start with the idea of what is ubiquitous computing? Let's give it a definition. Well, we can start by looking at what the definition of ubiquitous is. And from this dictionary entry, we can see that ubiquitous means present, appearing, or found everywhere. And you might use it in a sentence like, the air is ubiquitous, it's all around me. Or like the one here in the dictionary, cowboy hats are ubiquitous among the male singers. Okay. In one sense, then, when we talk about ubiquitous computing, what we mean is we mean a world in which computers are all around us. Uh, they're part of our daily routine. We use them when we're um, doing work and when we're doing leisure. Uh, we use them to get places and we use them when we are still at home and at work, all the different places where we are. But ubiquitous computing is also an academic discipline as well. So beyond just describing a kind of computing, it also is a term that refers to a particular line of research. And that research started with an article published in Scientific American in 1991 called The Computer for the 21st Century by um, a guy named Mark Weiser. He was working at Xerox Park at the time, and he was thinking about the ways in which technology was advancing, looking at the ways that um, different philosophers had been thinking about tool usage and putting together a prediction about what the world was going to be like. His predictions were remarkably good considering they were made in 1991. Good 25 years before the iPhone came out and yet he was predicting a kind of mobile environment or a mobile computing um, world that's very much like the one that we have today. One of the things that he thought a lot about was about ways of um, waves of computing that go through different kinds of relationships that people have with computers. And as a good computer scientist, I'm going to start with wave zero, which is one that Weiser didn't really uh, talk about, but which I think is important to point out. And I would call this one the zero wave of computer computing. Uh, this was the age of computerless computing. And to give it a, cut, a rough timeline, rough time frame, I'd say that it was between about 1930 and 1940 when this was um, happening. At this point, computers are theoretical technology, um, and individuals like Church and Alan Turing established some fundamental limits on computability. They were kind of a new kind of mathematician, a kind of mathematician that would eventually become a computer scientist, but they existed at a time before there was actually a physical computer around to work on. And using some abstract ideas of what a computer would be like, they talked about some fundamental problems like the P equals NP problem, or whether a class of computing problems called polynomial time algorithms are really the same as another class of algorithms called, called non-deterministic polynomial time algorithms. This question, if P equals NP, remains one of the most foundational theoretic, theoretical problems uh, that exists in computer science today. I would say the zero wave of computing is a little bit like where we're at with quantum computing today. While there are some small quantum computers and different approaches and different organizations that are taking stabs at trying to create them, there is a much richer set of research that has been done thinking about what a quantum computer could do if we had a fully featured com uh, quantum computer that was much larger than a handful of um, qubits. So in the same way that we have sort of an idea of what a quantum computer might be like if it is fully realized, in the zero wave of computing, the idea of what the, cur the computers that we have today are going to be like were being decided. And of course, we did end up with the computers that they were envisioning. So Weiser introduced an idea of the first wave, and the first wave centered around mainframe computing, giving it a rough time frame about 1960 to 1970. And in this world, there were massive computers doing simple data processing but there were very few computers in the world. Um, here's a picture of uh, a mainframe with a dot matrix, it's with a printer, I think it's a dot matrix printer in front of it, one of the main ways in which you got output out of these computers. Many people used these computers, so you couldn't afford very many of them. Organizations like maybe government agencies or scientific agencies 
uh, would have them. Maybe a large corporation might have them. They did relatively simple work by our standards today. In the military context, they computed various kinds of ballistics tables. In a business context, they might have computed simple spreadsheets or done accounting work. Um, and in scientific environments, they might have been the first kinds of weather prediction, uh, sources of weather prediction at the time. Well, Weiser indicated that this would be the beginning and then predicted that the second wave would come around. The second wave, which we eventually came to know as desktop computing, roughly the, fr the time frame from 1980 to 1990, time when Microsoft really came to the forefront as a massive global corporation that did computing. What drove it were business applications. These were the primary applications of the desktop computer. And the vision would be, would be that there would be one computer per desk. This was focused on the business environment. And desktop computers looked a little bit like um, this one here. Although this is a desktop computer at home, so pardon the slight mismatch in that way. These computers were connected in intranets. And they were in a massive global network. but they weren't really in the internet as we know it today. Mostly they were um, intranets that were isolated from one another. They existed within particular academic institutions or within particular offices, connecting the computers in those local areas with maybe very small or, um, if any, connections to the rest of the internets. And all of these computers were wired. The idea of a wireless computer wasn't really uh, a thing that was, hap was um, entering the market at that point. Eventually, of course, these computers moved into the home environment where they would be used for uh, working from home and sometimes entertainment purposes, games, uh, maybe learning, educational contexts as well. Weiser then said the third wave would be ubiquitous computing as we know it today. Roughly from 2000 maybe to the present, uh, I'm not sure that we would say we've gone beyond the ubiquitous computing stage yet. Um, this is a stage of computing where it's not really business or government applications that are driving usage. It's much more about information creation, information access, and communication that's driving the usage. So here's an example of third wave computing. This is someone with an um, early phone taking a picture of a lion, taking it to share it with someone else or maybe just for their own memory, but certainly not driven by a business application, trying to get some sort of competitive advantage. In this world, though, we're starting to think about the relationship between computers changing so that there are multiple computers per environment or multiple computers per person. Terms like WAN, wide area network, LAN, local area network, PAN, personal area network, and ad hoc networking uh, came to the forefront. And wireless networking was clearly a direction that the computers were taking. At this point, Weiser predicted that computers would begin to disappear. Now, when you first hear that, you think, oh, computers disappearing, that's because they're getting smaller. Yeah, I get that. And while Weiser was certainly talking about that in part, he was also talking about computers disappearing in a very different way. He was talking about computers disappearing uh, from our awareness when we're using them. So as an example, you might think about something like a hammer. A hammer, if you know how to use one and it's functioning well, uh, you don't really think about it when you're using it to hammer in a nail. You act through that hammer to build your birdhouse or your house or whatever you're trying to build. Or another example is a car. Once you've learned how to drive a car and you want to go somewhere, you don't think very much about the controls of the car. When you turn, you turn the steering wheel, but you're focusing mostly on where you're going. When you want to go faster, you hit the accelerator, and when you want to slow down, you hit the brake. But those controls become an extension of your will and an extension of your body as you move through the world. As long as the car is functioning okay, and um, you could just work through the, that, those vehicle, the vehicle or the hammer to accomplish what it is that you want to try and do. In a similar way, Weiser anticipated that we would begin to work through computers in this way. Um, that we would stop thinking about the fact that we're using computers, and we would start just working through them, and they would become tools that we become very naturally attuned to. In many cases, the kinds of things that we do today may be with Instagram or um, instant messaging or computing uh, or communications, we're still kind of very aware that we're using computers. So they haven't exactly shifted seamlessly into the background. Those things are pretty obviously front and center. Yet, there are many computers that we interact with on a daily basis where we don't actually think very much about the computer. The car, for example, is cars, modern cars are filled with all kinds of computing devices. Appliances that we use are filled with all kinds of computing devices. Maybe in some of our voice-enabled assistants, like Alexa or Siri or Google um, Home, 
we're beginning to get a sense, we're beginning to lose uh, focus on the computer and we're starting to be able to act naturally with our computers and not think so much about the um, technology that's supporting it along the way. Well, the relationship to computers changes in these each, each of these waves. In the zeroth wave, the relationship is just a thought experiment. People are thinking about computers. In the first wave, there are many people working on one computer. So a mainframe computer, a team of government scientists, um, a team of uh, corporate accountants, all working together on one computer in one particular space. In the second wave, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between individuals and computers, desktop computing paradigm being the predominant way. In the third wave, we start to get into a world that starts that seems a little bit more familiar to the one we're in now, where one person has many different computers, maybe a phone, maybe a smart watch, maybe a desktop, maybe a server, maybe a TV, um, maybe kind of sophisticated appliances. Um, maybe you have a fancy uh, interface on your car. And now one individual has many, many different computers that they're managing. The relationship has changed in this third wave. Another thing that Weiser brought out, in addition to the relationship between the people and the computers in terms of scale, and also in terms of the invisibility of the computers as they drop to the background of our consciousness as we were using them, he also wanted to draw a distinction between different kinds of computing that even at the time were, um, people were very excited about. And that's the difference between ubiquitous computing and virtual reality. One thing about ubiquitous computing is that when you do ubiquitous computing um, actions and when you're operating in that kind of paradigm, you're thinking about the devices adapting to the way in which we live our life. So here's an example of a phone and just in a very simple example, as you turn the phone 90 degrees, so it goes from portrait to landscape mode, the screen layout changes. This is a really simple example, but it's a way in which the computer is aware of its environment and it adapts to the way that we're moving through the world. Likewise, as this is a mapping application, if that dot presumably is where I am, it's also responding to my location and it's changing the way in which it's displaying that information in order to uh, react to the world. Now, a proper ubiquitous computing application would take some kind of um, action on behalf of the user when they're in a sp particular space and have indicated a need for some kind of computational support. Um, this is just displaying a location rather than actually doing anything in particular. Now on the other side though are, is virtual reality. This is an example of someone using virtual reality gear, a headset that's covering their complete vision, gloves that have haptics in it through which they can control objects in the virtual ro world and receive feedback. And what is it that they're experiencing? Well they might be looking at a virtual world like this virtual world from Open Simulator. Created by users, completely um, covering the field of view of the individual, and the user can move through it. But they have to be careful because it's very easy to forget that you're connected to this gear, and if you move too fast, you might pull a wire, or if you're in a more mobile environment, you might hit a real wall as you try and work, walk through the virtual environment and don't see, an actual, don't see a virtual wall where the real wall is. A third kind of thing like virtual reality is something that I would call a mirror world. A mirror world is something maybe more like Google Earth or Google Maps, where a virtual world is constructed that's designed to mirror the real world so that you can enter into the mirror world and use it as a proxy for exploring the real world in some way. Maybe for directions, maybe to get a view of what a different location is like, um, maybe to experience the landscape or real estate or something along those lines for a Google Map view. These are two different, very different ways of thinking about interacting with computing. But then there in the middle is augmented reality. Augmented reality is a little of both sides, and maybe we could think of this as being the boundary between ubiquitous computing and virtual reality. What happens with augmented reality is you use some sort of device and you hold it up and a camera on the one side of the device takes a picture of the world in front of you and shows you what you could simply see if you didn't have the camera in front of you. But the benefit of looking at the display is that the computer, the phone in this case, can overlay the, vi the view on the camera with information relevant to the view that you're experiencing. So in this case, the application is location aware, and as you look at different things in your immediate environment, it will overlay it with icons, recommendations, and information about the places that you're viewing. Kind of a mix between virtual reality and ubiquitous computing in that way. 
Now, the key thing about these two paradigms and the way that um, Weiser differentiated them was that ubiquitous computing was really about computers entering the human's world. Computers getting out of the office and out of the labs and, and starting to understand the world, the sensing, the temperature, the experiences that the human was having and adapting to that. Virtual reality, in contrast, is a human entering into the computer's world, accepting all of the input and sensory uh, experience that the computer wants to generate the human then reacts to the computer instead of the computer reacting to the human. Different applications for both sides, but also different ideas about what these kinds of paradigms of computing were or are. All right, so what's next? What's next with our relationship with computers? Weiser really only saw ubiquitous computing as being um, the third wave and didn't really talk much about what the next phase might be. One thing that's clear is that there are going to be more and more computers and that the relationship between people and the computers might not be quite so uh, distinct. It might not be that computers are discreetly owned by one particular individual. You might have a home TV, for example, that's owned by multiple people. Or you might have phones that you share, or computers that you swap, or different accounts so that now the ability to find these relationships between different um, computers and different people becomes a lot more muddy a lot more difficult to associate the computing resources with particular individuals. And a real difficult question is how are we going to manage all of these devices? How are we going to keep track of them? How are we going to do work with them? On top of that, there's a whole lot of maintenance that has to be done. How are we going to keep them operating? How are we going to keep the software up to date? How are we going to make sure that the networks are working? How are we going to manage all of that infrastructure? Well, this is something that I think is really drives us into cloud computing. This requires professionals. And what kind of professionals? Well, professionals that run cloud computing infrastructures. Companies like Amazon Web Services and Apple Computer. Businesses that are eager to um, find a way to provide value to different users and help them navigate this complex digital environment. So the key points from this lecture are that ubiquitous computing is really a paradigm started by Mark Weiser in the 1990s that described people's relationships to computers. On the one hand, it talked about scale, it talked about the scale of individuals to number of computers, so one, to, um, many people to one computer, one to one, and then many computers to one person. It also talked about the scale of the computer in terms of its physical size. Are you working with a big computer or a small computer as mentioned in his vision as well. He also talks about invisibility of computers. Yes, getting physically smaller, but more importantly, becoming the, in the uh, moving into the background of our consciousness as we work through them, um, as, as we stop to um, recognize that we're actually using computers to get work done. And then finally, he talked a lot about what res, what's going to result from those changes. And one of the things that we've seen is that cloud computing is a valuable tool for trying to manage this trajectory going forward. Thanks for listening to this short lecture on ubiquitous computing, an academic discipline that I've done a lot of work in, and how it leads into the current world that we're experiencing with um, cloud computing services being offered to us um, from a variety of different companies. Thank you.